Hello, Pet World, and welcome to another edition of Natural Pets TV. I'm Robert Semro, and I am joined by two experts in the natural pet world. I have Bill Bookout and Greg Tilford. Guys, thanks for joining me. Appreciate being here. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for having me. You know, one of the things that I really love is I have my own herb garden just specifically for my pets. And a lot of the things that I'm using for my pets, I am also using for my family. But it is really a great way for me to have it. I know where it's been grown, what's been going into it. I know that environment. But the thing that I love the most is, it's something that my wife and my kids and I, we all enjoy doing. We take a lot of pride in it. And there's that extra little bit of satisfaction when you know Zoe or Sugar were just getting in there and, and enjoying something that we grew or we knew was healthy. What do you you know say to folks? Because we could walk into pretty much all of your kitchens out there, and we could find something that they've got in there in their kitchen cupboard. Yeah, it's amazing because you know as a, as an herbalist as I am, that's been working for a long time. Oftentimes we get so tied up looking at the advancements in herbal medicine and we look at you know the the exotic from the Amazon and we look at all of these different things that you know have fancy names and all this research and stuff and we forget what's under our nose every day it's growing in the flower bed it's in the spice cabinet and there's there's stuff in every every kitchen that is infinitely I mean useful I mean and it's being used all the time culinary thyme for instance you know we use it for seasoning chicken and things like that it's got all kinds of antimicrobial properties. It's, it helps you make a tea with it. You can, you can use it for coughs. It has cough suppressant qualities. The primary volatile oil, thymol, in that herb is the active constituent in Listerine. You oh. know, and we tend to overlook it just by virtue of how common it is in our lives. You know, and and it, there, the list goes on. I mean, parsley, for instance. You know, Bill and I were talking about his cat and urinary tract issue. Parsley root is a really strong, but safe, uh, really safe to use, low risk um, diuretic herb. It's really good for stimulating diuresis and flushing out the urinary tract, specific for a lot of different things that, that need that function. Yeah, you talked, Robert, about, you know, people have herb gardens for themselves. They want their family, you know, live a long, happy, healthy life. You stop and think about it. We want the same thing for our pets, right? right? We want them to live a long, happy, healthy, good quality life. And so Greg mentioned, you know, we ha now have a cat that adopted us. I've always been a dog guy, but four months ago we got a cat. It was a feral cat, now he's our cat. And so he loves dry cat food. And I'd like to get him off dry cat food because I know that it can cause stones or other urinary tract issues. And we often, you know, overlook things that are right under our nose that might help enhance palatability on a home prepared natural diet, but it would make it more attractive to him rather than, you know, dry sure. cat food. Well, Absolutely. and that's a good point because you can be adding this to anything, whether mm -hmm. it's raw, home cooked, lightly prepared, or kibble, and it's right there, it's, it's convenient. Right. Yeah, rosemary, another good example, it has a calmative effect. It's good for nervous disorders, it's good for acute anxiety problems. It helps support a calming effect in thunderstorms, trips to the vet and such, and it, it's as simple as just steeping it in hot water, making a tea, and pouring it over the food. And the reason I say to do that is that a lot of these herbs, especially in carnivores, you can feed them whole. You can feed parsley leaf as part of, you know, it's a chlorophyll-rich additive to food. It's, it's a good food ingredient. But they're not going to get all of the medicinal qualities out of it because the carnivore's body lacks the enzymes and, and such to effectively break down those plant materials and get it out. So if you, if you make teas out of some of these culinary herbs, you're, you'll, have, you'll have better effect. It'll, it'll be much more bioavailable to the carnivore's body. Um, I like to use sage in the mouth. Sage, if you just take a little bit of ground up sage, dry sage, add some water and make it into a poultice or a paste. You can rub it on the gum lines to help reduce uh, inflammation in the gums, infections in the mouth. Add a drop or two of golden seal to that mixture and you've got a really potent and, and useful. I, it's funny, that was one of the first introductions to herbal medicine that I ever had. Is uh, I had one of those situations where you eat a, a corn chip, you know, a tortilla chip, big, and you bite into it and the point goes, <laughs> right, right up, you know, underneath the tooth, and it hurt like hell, you know, and it got all festered and in infected. So, an herbalist friend of mine said, "Just take some culinary sage, make a poultice out of it, make a big wad, and just tuck it up between your cheek and gum, and just leave it there as long as you can stand the flavor." And you know, it really helped a lot. It really, it, it's anesthetic. It helps relieve pain, and it's you know, fennel seed, good for flatulence and gas, and also has 
an antispasmodic property in the gut. So, you know, the, the griping stomach pains and such upset stomach in dogs, it's really good. Um, it just, the list goes on and on. Well, it does, but there are some things that we might think, oh, well, heck, it's there. Should we always be using it? Yeah, I was going to say that. You know, people shouldn't think that, well, everything that's good for me or I've got in my herb garden, I should just automatically give it to my pets. You know, herbs, you should be informed. You should be educated. You should consult expert references like Greg, others, your program. So you should be, you should use things intelligently and, you know, the risk is oftentimes in the amount, quantity, or the dose. So be informed. Don't just think, well, I give it to myself. I use it for, you know, garlic, um, other things like that. It's okay. Be, be informed and don't just make assumptions. Right. For, you know, always, always err to caution. You know, a good general rule that I tell people is, you know, if it's, if it's safe and considered food, you don't even view it as a medicine like parsley and sage and rosemary and that, that, that sort of herb, then it's, it's likely to be a, a low risk proposition and pretty safe to use in your animals too. If it's something advanced like blue cohosh or some you know, cardiogenic herb like foxglove digitalis, which is pretty toxic, you know, don't right. assume that just because it comes from the natural world that it's safe. You know? So the culinary everyday herbs are, are easy for somebody that knows nothing about herbal medicine to pick up and use. You know, and it's interesting because it's, it's by virtue of the consumerism and capitalism in this country, we're driven to all these products and supplements and such that are designed for use as dose form products and, and nutritional supplements and such. But we forget this. And, you know, I, I recently went to Taiwan and did a lecture in, in Taiwan, touring my book and, and introducing my formulations there. And I thought this is going to be interesting, first of all, you know, with a, you know, a translator, it's always interesting speaking. Right. But I was expecting an audience of people that would know nothing about the concept of using herbs in animals. And what I found was 150 people that were welcoming me there, there because they have been going through the efforts of actually having an herb garden specifically for their pets. They just grew herbs for their pets. And they were welcoming me because, well, we have a convenience now that we didn't have before. So they've been doing it for a long time just because they don't have access to all of the wonderful products that we have in this country. Hey Greg, uh, let me ask you a question. Can you, can you talk just a little bit, because we often get asked questions at NANC about herbal ingredients, you know, raw herbs versus extracts and tinctures and things like that. Can you talk just a little bit about the differences in those and things that people might want to be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big believer in, in liquid herbal extracts for animals, especially in a glycerin base, which is very sweet tasting, neutral to cask because they don't taste sweet but it doesn't contain alcohol and it's easy to feed for one thing. You know, there's a, there's a saying to herbalists that a medicine that cannot be administered is not a medicine, you know? Very yeah, true. And absolutely. The other thing is, is to always keep in mind that carnivores really have a hard time digesting um, plant materials. They, have, they can't break down the cellulose barriers, cellulose barriers in, the, uh, in the plant cell structures and such. So, it's not that they won't utilize some of it, but a lot of it's going to pass through before they can. They've got a high acid content and a very short digestive tract. So, you know, herbal capsules and powders, they're all, they all can be applied effectively, but the rules of application to a, a, many of the general users, you know, are more complicated by the fact that it has to be digested and transported. So I like liquids. And usually in, in carnivores, especially herbivores, on the other hand, and fortunately for those you know viewers that have horses out there, you know the question comes up: Well, if I'm feeding herbs to my horse, do I have to give them like 10 pounds of something that costs me $20 a pound every time I feed it? Because you know we're feeding a thousand-pound animal, and the answer is no, because they're herbivores and they're metabol metabolically designed to utilize these plant materials very effectively, and yeah. so the dose and the feeding amounts whether it be liquid or dry herbs, is much lower proportionately than it would be for a dog and a, or a cat. The other thing uh, maybe you could comment on, I think it'd be beneficial to viewers, we often get asked a question, um, you know, people think it's a natural substance, you know, and there's no possibility of an adverse reaction. Um, and also, if a little is good, more might be better, yeah, right? Right. Um, could you talk a little bit about those things? It's often a question that we get at NAC. Yeah, I think, I think that, um, the old school perspective and a lot of the old texts and still I have to admit a lot of the teachers and herbalists out there will, will, will walk down the road of, of, of saying that 
these are safe. You know, God or nature put these here. They're plants, they're not drugs, and therefore you don't have to worry about safety. The truth is, is that a large percentage of our pharmaceuticals are derived from constituents that come in plants. And the truth is that some of the constituents that are most powerful in plants, like volatile oils, essential oils, they're there to actually protect the plant and create certain toxicities if, if used in a raw form. And, you know, just because it's an herb, more is not necessarily better. In fact, sometimes less is better because all you, all you want to do is sensitize something, like with nettle, for instance. Nettle has formic acid, stinging nettle. Anyone who's walked into a patch of stinging nettle knows what I'm talking about. Um, if, if you haven't introduced yourself to that plant, it will introduce itself to you. Right? And you will remember it. And yes. you will remember it. But once, once it's dry, those constituents are nullified, so you can actually eat the plant. But when you ingest that plant, it actually sensitizes and stimulates a response, a histamine response. And in small amounts, that can be used to strengthen your histamine response because you're, you're preparing your body or an animal's body for hay fever season. So more is not better in that circumstance as one example. And um, yes, there are some very, very powerful chemicals in the, plant, in the plant kingdom that you need to be aware of. But that's why I say, you know, going back to the kitchen herbs, you've got a pretty good margin of, of you, it's a low risk situation. And, and we think about it, you know, health and wellness is really a three dimensional thing, right? It's a sphere, diet, exercise, environment, and herbs can be, as a, as, a, as a component of diet, happy and healthy diet, can be a component of living a long, happy, healthy life for animals or our companion animals, just like it is for our for Exactly, our, for that's our why family. they're here. That's why nature provides them. That's right. It's well, part, part of the natural system. I, I love this. This is something that all of us can be involved with. Go out, plant a herb garden, enjoy it, get your family involved. As you've heard in this discussion, I mean, there's just so many great directions that you can go and a lot of great information out there. It's so easy, so simple. We always talk about, well, I don't know, I'm uncertain. Folks, right here, they've just shown you how you're already doing it. You just may not have tried it the way that you should. So go out there, have some fun. Thanks for joining us here on Natural Pets TV. Financial and other considerations have been provided by Animal Essentials, Natura Pets Organics, the National Animal Supplement Council, and the Well Dog Place. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. And let's keep the conversation going. We wanna know what's impacting your pets and the things that you're interested in finding out more about. Put that in the comment section down below. And in the meantime, if you wanna find out more information about Greg Tilford, visit theanimalherbalist.com or animalessentials.com or our good friend Bill Bookout from the NASC, you can go to nasc.cc or visit animalsupplements.org. And as always, you can reach out to us directly at petworldinsider.com.